Okay, here we go. Chassis support. Now this off started with this uh, picture and and a post that that uh, Ben in the Speed Therapy Academy sent in. That we kind of talked about. And uh, what you're looking at is this is this is an SN95 or I can't remember SN95 or Fox, one of those cars that was converted to IRS and a coilover shock system. Now, as you can see here, uh, the the actual shock mount has pulled away from the inner fender pretty severely. Uh, and what he's talking about, uh, I, this is a long post, and I kind of chopped it off just so you can see a bit bigger uh, picture. Let's say he was it's, it's throwing it in the trash. He had somebody else's like rear uh, shock tower uh, brace, and he said it was junk. He's going to throw it in the trash. I'm guessing that's the remnants of it here, you know, both of the inner fender. But he says, uh, I'm curious if I got unlucky or maybe it, it's something that could be, there's, there's something that could prevent this from some other folks in the future. <laughs> Actually, there is. And this is it. This is our uh, rear shock tower brace for SN95. And we developed this back when uh, we started converting, we started working on uh, the IRS cars in 99 and converting them to coilover. And because we were converting them to coilover, uh, what we did is I wanted all the all the load, not only the spring, the shock load, but the spring loads went right in here to this the rear shock mount. And they really weren't designed for that kind of load. They were designed for the, just the load of the shock absorber. So we added the three-point strut tower brace. And the whole idea is we kind of capture we, it, it, it captures the uh, the shock mount. Uh, the, the shock actually bolts right through the hole in the middle of it. And then there's two bolts on the side that bolt it into uh, the mount itself. So it's pretty secure. And then we've got a third one in the middle. So we actually get some level of triangulation uh, between the two shock, shock towers. And this has made a huge difference. We never have never ever had any kind of issue with uh, with uh, uh, any, any kind of issue in pulling away. So let me show you real quick okay so here's here's what actually looks like in person this is the rear shock tower brace and you can see that we have it so that the shock goes right through and then we also bolt it to the to the uh the shock mount and then there's a, th a third spot in, in the middle so you can see we've got a triangulation and triangulation is the strongest part the strongest uh strongest engineering fixture so let's go back okay so we got the triangulation and that that's that supports the shock the other thing that we do that's different than anybody else is the uh, the typical mount for the the bayonet type shock in the back is is rubber uh, either soft or hard or well, we because all the load is going into the uh, the rear uh, shock mount we actually use urethane uh, between the shock and the, and the body so that it, it's no give and stays firm. I mentioned triangulation. This is getting back to my very early days when I started my racing career back in the 70s. Uh, my exposure to chassis strength and rigidity and came from uh, working with Formula Ford space frames. Now you can see there's a whole bunch of triangles and this one's even a little bit better, but triangles are strongest uh, most rigid engineering uh, structure. And the, all the race cars back then, I mean, they had tons and tons of triangulation. That's what makes them rigid. The more rigid a race car, the better it's going to handle. Uh, the more uh, rigid or, 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 sh or stiffer a street car is, A, the better it's going to handle, and B, the better ride quality it's going to have, and C, it takes away rattles and squeaks. So this is what I started. This is what I started learning about uh, chassis and strength back in the 70s. But take that and let's put it into like a full-size car. And you can see this is just kind of a, a drawing of, of a, a tube-frame race car. And again, there's like triangles everywhere to add strength. But when we get to a, a production unibody, uh, like all the cars are today, there's there's not much, there's no triangulation, there's not much strength, but just a bunch of sheet metal pieces that are spot welded together, which is why they have a tendency to flex so much. The early Mustangs really, really flex really bad. So what we did is I came up with some solutions, like for the flea race cars, it was okay because we had full cages, which stiffened up the chassis quite a bit. So <clears throat> what we did do 
it was back in 86. <clears throat> and the first chassis thing that we did, but even though the, uh, the race cars had a full cage, uh, the first thing we did was uh, put jackie rails on the side. And we're doing, you know, 6, 12, 24-hour races. The cars get jacked up a lot for tire changes, brake changes. So we put a rail that goes right along the pinch wheel. This is actually for an SN95. The Fox is a, is a little bit longer, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. But we came up with a jacking rail so we could jack the car up quickly and easily, and uh, we could jack, just jack one side up at, at once. So after after the Slim program, you know, we brought that uh, into our street cars because just you know, a lowered, lowered Mustang you didn't have to, like, crawl around the ground uh, trying to look for a place to put your jack. You just put the jacking rail in there, and you, know, you just jack the car up. So that was the first thing we did. And the next thing we did is to stiffen up the chassis came a little, a little bit later was the double cross subframe connector. Now this is this what this is what here. This connects the front and rear subframes. And what I did, which is called double cross, is we put the bracket in the middle that bolts to the, the back of the seat. Uh, there's already bolts right in the chassis, so it's just a matter of putting a nut on it. And uh, and what that does is reduces the the free span versus captured length. And then also, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever put a yard, yard sign up either for, you know, a yard sale or, or uh, you know, political sign. But if you just put a, a piece of cardboard on a stick, it'll just flop all over the place. So that's why you always put a little T in there to keep it from flopping. With the same principle here is by putting this T in here, that helps strengthen it so it doesn't want to twist. And we had, back when we first brought these out, we had one, one guy call and said that he thought it was junk because he could, put either end on, on a cinder block and stand in the middle and it would bend. Uh, I, I said, yeah, but did you put a cinder block under the, under the middle? Uh, and that kind of shut them up. So that, that was the second part that we did to it. And then a little later on, we, I, I wanted to add even more strength. So we had the matrix brace, which is pretty unique. A lot of people have copied our jacking rail. A lot of people have copied the double cross subframe connectors. Nobody's really copied the matrix brace so far, which I don't understand because that's that's probably the most important part. But by adding the matrix brace here in the middle, you can see that we add four triangulations, four full triangulations per side. And triangles are the, you know, the strongest uh, engineering structure. And here's a little different view of it. And this is actually for, I think, the 99, you know, 96, 98 Cobra, somewhere in there. We actually have to shorten them up a little bit uh, due to the, uh, the transmission mount. Uh, but even so, there's still, the, the, the subframe would be right here, and it still connects four triangulations, uh, connects front and back, uh, cross in the middle so it doesn't flex. I mean, this adds an enormous amount of rigidity to the center of the car. And here's what it kind of looks like under, underneath, all installed. And you can just tell by looking at it that that's, that's real structure. And it doesn't add a ton of weight. <clears throat> Back in when we first started doing these, we had like drag racing guys that, that wouldn't want to add these because it added, you know, like 10 pounds or something like that. And you know, just couldn't get through their heads that they're wasting horsepower twisting the body. Uh, when if they, if they strengthen the body, that horsepower goes to the back. But they just uh, didn't think that way. So let me, let me show you a few pieces. Uh, well, let me let me start with the uh, the Fox uh, jacking rail. This is the identical copy of what we had on the on the '86 Celine cars, and it's it's pretty long. It's like 59 and a half inches long, or something like that. And I try to keep it under the 60 60 uh, limit for <laughs> UPS, but it's 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 a good piece. I mean, it welds right to the pinch uh, pinch weld. And back in 86, when we first did this, the SCCA declared this as a illegal chassis stiffening device. <laughs> it made no sense. We had, had a full cage in there. So I actually had to take a hacksaw and put just a little bitty groove, two grooves, uh, so it wouldn't be considered a continual piece. In 87, they didn't, even think, didn't mention, mention anything about it. But this is a jack and rail for the Fox. Also, it fits the S197 and it fits Gen 1 Mustangs. But for the SN95, because it's it's the pinch, pinch wells are a little different and they've got all these little darts that come through. What we did is we had to do it a little different. I mean, we went to like an inch by inch and a half 
and we have these holes on the other side so little darts that uh, for the holding the body in place slide right into that and you can weld that up right up there and it's 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 a uh, not quite as long but equally as efficient the other cool thing about the jacking rails is that uh once you jack the car up you can put your jack stands underneath from the jacking rails and a hole underneath the car opens up and then the the next thing is going to be the uh, double cross subframe connector which was the original on the market and again you can see that these are these are really nice strong uh, high quality pieces and we uh, unlike everybody else <clears throat> we kind of pinch pinch the ends down so it's not an, not an edge and, and unlike others there actually is a little bit of a bend front and rear to conform to the body a little bit better uh, like i say every these, these have been copied by so many different people uh, but this is the original and still the best. And something else I might point out is all our under chassis pieces are uh, silver zinc uh, plated so that for uh, durability and rust protection. And we, in the beginning, we talked about maybe powder coating because we powder coat everything else. But the, the, the problem with powder coat is you have to grind it off when you weld it. Or if you don't, it's going to be the... Uh, it's going to create noxious fumes. So with by going to the, uh, the zinc plating, uh, you can weld it, and you don't get you don't knock yourself out with fumes. Now this is the matrix brace, and this is we actually this is actually longer than it's supposed to be. And it's simply because what we found when we started building these is there's no two chassis alike. So the whole idea is we made them a little bit longer. So that when it, for each individual application, you could just trim this down to however fits well. Because originally we, we you know, started building these, we found that they didn't fit some cars that were too short. So then we started building them longer. But then again, you can see that that these little brackets weld right to the the frame rail. This is actually for a 197 because the the back is flipped. So that's kind of our, that's our uh, uh, matrix system. So that's under an, an, an under a uh, SN95. Now this would be under the S197. What we, with the S197, they actually have a frame rail that runs front to back, which negates the need for the double cross subframe connector because there is uh, no gap between the subframes front and rear. There's already a, a channel there. So what we do is we just, do the the jacking around the outside we do the matrix brace and then we just weld the matrix brace right to the existing uh uh rail uh frame rail that's right in there so it's uh it, and it works really good we had one of our customers uh decided to use only our products as he he got this system for his s197 and he thought well i'll give this a try and see if it's any good and he, he found the difference to be so significant that he's just He's been a devotee ever since. And in fact, I think we just set him up with uh, his set his car up for track. And moving forward to the 550 cars is what we found is that underneath the, uh, the 550s, a huge difference just in the chassis itself. Uh, much, much stronger, much more rigid. And they had to because of the new suspension, the, uh, the IRS in the back and then the, the, the double arm uh, McPherson strut in the front requires a much stiffer chassis than in the, in the past. So in the way they did the, the underside is really difficult uh, to go in and just weld along a pinch weld. So what we did is there's there's a couple of bolts front and rear that are really handy. And you can see what we've done is we've made access. This bolts right to exi with existing bolts, existing bolt holes. So it's just slick as can be uh, the bolt right up, but was unique is the fact that these aren't tubes like everybody else. These are fabricated jacking rails. And the reason they're fabricated is because there's a five degree uh, slant on the body where this would mount to. So what we did is we, the bottom is perpendicular to the ground, so it's level and perpendicular to the ground. But because this, this is a, a trapezoid and not, uh, not a rectangle, we get this five degree angle in here, so it just bolts up firm to the chassis. 
per, bolts from the chassis and then the bottom is perpendicular. Uh, it's something nobody else is doing. But we decided that this is this is going to be the best way to to for the for the 550 cars, and it's, it's like a, like a 20 minute bolt on. It's a piece of cake, but sure makes a difference when jacking up the cars. So that's the only only under chassis support we have that's a bolt on, and not uh, uh, not a weld on. For the Fox SN95s, we weld everything under the chassis uh, because if you're if you're bolting, you're having to create holes, and, <clears throat> and it's, it's, they're not going to last. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna wobble and, and work itself loose. And besides, you know, Ford doesn't bolt the the uh, the bodies together. But on the one night, but on the 550s, uh, there's already two strong points, two existing bolt holes, so they're not gonna you know wobble or move around. It's just gonna be a really nice uh, mount. So I think uh, we're gonna move on to uh, stretch tire braces. Uh, the stretch tire brace pretty interesting. Back in, in 86 in the Celine cars, I mean, we really struggled to make the 86 cars race worthy. And one of the things is we always have problems getting them. I mean, they didn't really want to turn. I mean, they go like stink in a straight line, but stopping and turning were, the, were two big issues. So one of the solutions I came up with <clears throat> is I, made, I built the three-point strut tower brace, and we put on put it on the, on both cars. The 86 cars uh, for Road Atlanta, uh, and unfortunately, you know, the FCCA uh, tech people came up and said, "Well, that's not part of the production car, so you can't run it." So we, we could use it for that weekend, but we couldn't uh, use it the rest of the season. But you know that was kind of a clue, and it really didn't make a difference. So what we did on the 80, <clears throat> we you know we kind of re-engineered the whole Celine uh, street cars over the winter between 86 and 87. So the, I got all the all the things into the production car that I needed for the race cars. Uh, three point strut tower brace was part of it. Uh, four wheel disc brakes was another. Uh, five lugs. So there's a bunch of stuff that from the race program fed right into the production cars. So in '87, that point forward, all those lane cars had a three point strut tower brace. And uh, this this is kind of a pretty close to an example of what was originally on the the uh, '86 Celine cars. Uh, right now, I mean, the only we, we used to have uh, you know quite a few stretch tower braces, uh, but right now the only one we actually have uh, in production is for the 0304 Cobra. Yeah. And again, you can see all our stuff is just really super high quality. Uh, this is our kind of signature powder coat. It's a kind of a really cool gray metallic. Uh, and you can see that we bolt that right to the stop, top of the strut tower and then back to the firewall. And that creates, you would think that that create, creates one triangulation, but in reality, in reality, it creates three triangulations. So here's the most obvious one, strut tower to strut tower to firewall. But if you take a look, you also have we're, this is a triangulation here. We're triangulating. We're, we're bridging the gap between in the corner, which makes this a triangle and makes this a triangle. So we're actually putting three triangles in the front of a car. Uh, we put four triangles per side under the car and putting three triangles in front. And then in the back, uh, we're putting uh, actually three triangles, if, if you look at it this way, the rear shock tower brace. So I love triangles. Now the 197s came out. Uh, this is this was is not a firewall. This is just thin sheet metal, and it's a divider between the, the engine compartment and and the firewall. And to me, there was no real value in in tying into that uh, because it was pretty flexy. So we just went with a two point strut tire brace, which really had a, made a big difference. Uh, so much so, I can't remember what year, but Ford eventually started putting a strut tower brace, two-point strut tower braces on their cars. But we were the first one to come out with this in, in 05 when the cars first came out. And we used to build these. Uh, we'll probably get them back in production someday, but this was our inner, inner skeleton, as we called it, uh, the super street cage. And this really has a huge amount of internal structure. And even though it looks like it might be a six point, in all actuality, it was an eight point. 
We've got the main hoop. Uh, so there's two points there. We've got the rear bars. There's two points there. We've got the front bars. There's two points there. But also, these little tabs up here, we actually bolt that to the, the seat uh, bolt, the seat belt uh, bolt in the B pillar, uh, which actually makes it more rigid. So we've got, I think, just a handful of these left. Uh, we'll probably get back into producing these um, maybe next year. Uh, we've got a lot of things we've got to get caught up on. We just, uh, a lot of you know, just to bring into the market this new rear suspension that's kind of taking up a lot of time, but it's moving along nicely. Uh, and uh, you, I think we might be almost ready to do another little presentation for the next group of people on the, on the new uh, Kenny Brown K Link rear suspension. That's phenomenal. But we do have for the uh, S197 and 550 cars is a four point roll bar. Uh, we have a lot of our track day guys uh, are going over this because uh, they don't use the back seat on track. So we're doing a, a rear seat delete and then doing the four point roll bar. But it's handy because it has this crossbar, which is really handy to wrap seat belts around uh, for, for track days. So that's kind of the uh, you know, where we've ended up with uh, on chassis. Oh, that's kind of what we're talking about. And the whole idea of stiffening a chassis is First of all, so the suspension works better. If you've got a chassis that flexes, what that ends up being is that is a fifth unwanted and unmanageable suspension component. Okay, because if, if you know springs and shocks are going up and down, but if the chassis is kind of doing this thing, if it's twisting, you don't have any way to control the twist. For the oscillation of the wheel, you've got a shock to control the spring oscillation, but if the chassis is twisting, there's nothing there to control it, which is why we go to a stiffer chassis. And one of the things that, that people notice like right away, I mean, you, you put like a, a matrix system on, you don't have to go but 100 yards so you can feel the difference. I mean, it's that, it's that significant. But a, a little trick that's important is anytime uh, people put uh, my chassis system on, I strongly recommend that they make sure that doors are closed. If it's a convertible, top up, doors closed. But you have to support the car under, under the suspension points, not under the chassis, under the suspension points, because you want the car to be pretty much sitting as it would on the ground. Because once you weld that stuff in place, it's there. And we've had instances where people have, have not paid attention to that, and they, you know, they put it up on a four-point hoist, welded it in, set down the ground, and the doors won't work. Well, that's because that shows you just how much the car bows, and and, and they what they have to do they get back back and cut them off and re-put them on. So it's important that if you put any kind of checks and structure on underneath that you get this supported under the axle under the front suspension arms. So that it's, it's as if it were sitting on the ground. So that's kind of the, the thing. And, and other, it also takes away squeaks and rattles. Uh, you know, those cars get older, they squeak and rattle. So that's, you know, the problem was that the, the Mustang, the unibody Mustangs, especially in, in the, the Fox, were really flimsy, almost like a tin can. We would actually see instances with Fox cars where guys would split the floor. I mean, actually split the floor right behind the driver's seat from the outside right over the top of the tunnel. Uh, if, if, if there's enough force to just split the floor, uh, you, you can imagine just how much those cars actually move. When we first started doing it, we could jack up, you know, the, like a front wheel, and the front wheel would be off the ground and the back wheel would still be on the ground. But once we put the chassis stuff on, you jack up the front wheel, everything moves up together. So it's really, really important. Uh, you know, that's that's my solution to you know and a nagging problem on Mustangs. 